Hey everybody, you're tuned in to 91.8 The Fan. This is Kana, and you're in my corner, and I'm here with a very special guest. He kind of sneaked in. We didn't see him with the, uh, you know, the ninja gear already in prepped. It's a pleasure. I'm sneaky. You should know <laughs> that going in. Well, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us, Dave. It is my pleasure to be here. I, uh, I've heard much about you. The word has gotten out on the internet, interweb. The series of tubes. You know what I'm talking about. Ah, oh, I get you. Maybe next time we'll go through the mind and just telepathically do this interview. <laughs> yeah, if I were to have uh, one power from Star Trek, like I know everybody wants the uh, the Vulcan uh, death grip there, the little the, the shoulder pinch, uh, I'm into the mind meld myself. be cool just to be able to knock somebody unconscious and then, you know, read their thoughts for a little while. Well, I can, I can tell that all the, the video game and anime voice acting has definitely, you know, expanded your imagination <laughs> with all that. Yeah, but I'm, certainly. I'm curious in your roots, however, because, you know, not you don't always start thrown into an anime or a video game. How did you originally get started in voice acting? Uh, my very first voice acting job I ever had uh, was for, let's see, what was the first one I ever did? I, I came at this sort of sideways. Um, oh, look at that. Hello, text message. Pardon me. I'm in the middle of something. Let that be a lesson to everyone. Technology is wonderful, but sometimes you can't escape it. Learn to mute your phones, people. All right. Um, I came at this kind of sideways uh, because I started out doing um, uh, plays and all the stuff that you normally do, which is, you know, no matter what kind of acting you're doing, you're doing, you know, acting is the primary uh art that you're practicing so uh i was you know i did plays i did all that kind of stuff in high school and then uh i wound up getting a job uh after a couple of um a couple of years of doing the classic waiter bartender thing i wound up getting a job in an independent theater production and at the same time i got a job on the radio so i worked for a station called wbcn in boston which is one of the all-time great heritage rock stations, um, like the the Rolling Stones, everybody played in that studio um, back in the day. I say back Very in the day nice. because it yeah it has since it has since gone out of business. But it used to be like if you're familiar with K Rock on the West Coast, it was like K Rock, but on the East Coast, it's where you know uh, Aerosmith was the was first played on the air. It's where um, uh, Peter Wolf was first played on the air, who's somebody you may not know, but he was from the Jay Giles band, which is somebody else you may not know. There's a lot of real, like, from, say, 1968 to 1993, there wasn't a single band that was important in rock and roll, whether it was classic rock or alternative rock, that didn't start out on that station in the, as far as, like, people hearing it in the Northeast. So you got to be so, a part uh, of history a little bit. Oh yeah, it was amazing. I actually came in. Uh, we came in one morning. Uh, my my radio partner and I used to do. Um, we'd fill in all over the station. So we would do like sometimes we'd do the afternoons from you know two to six, and sometimes we'd do nights from six to ten. Sometimes we'd do overnights from midnight to five in the morning, which uh, sounds great until you start realizing that everybody else is asleep when you're trying to work, and everyone else is working when you're trying to sleep. So. Yeah, we have a few DJs who have to be on that schedule. <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, it's a lot of fun because you get to do what you want to do, but it's not a lot of fun. Uh, you know, in LA, for example, there's leaf blowers and lawn mowers everywhere. So if you're trying to sleep at seven o'clock in the morning, someone somewhere is mowing a lawn, and you're not getting much sleep. Ooh. But anyway, so uh, I we came in actually came in one morning and. Uh, our station was the carried Howard Stern in the uh, in the Northeast, and uh, one of Howard Stern's favorite guys was a guy named Joey Ramone from the Ramones, and we came in to work one morning, and Joey Ramone had come in in the middle of the overnight shift and taken over, so we walked in to do the morning show, and Joey Ramone was there instead, because he just felt like playing music, so we hung out with him and let him do whatever he wanted to. Wow, very cool. So you yeah. you got to roll with the punches, and that must have Absolutely. really prepared you for, you know, diving in, into voice acting. But how did you make that, you know, jump from DJing to voice acting? 
Well, I was never like a straight up DJ. My partner uh, had been in uh, the wonderful world of radio for a long time. So he was like the DJ guy, and I was the sidekick character voice guy. So we did a lot of uh, comedy bits and stuff that we recorded and then put on the air. And uh, and while I was doing all of that, um, Boston's a pretty small town for the wonderful world of voiceover, but there are a couple of voiceover agents in that town. And one of them heard me and heard our bits and got in contact with us, and then I started doing you know a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Very cool. And yeah. obviously, you know, you got into anime eventually and I, I know video games was your first love but all of our fans want to jump into the anime thing so okay. i'm i'm curious with anime did you know what it was or was it something brand new or was it just a cartoon oh, yeah. no no i mean i didn't know it specifically as anime i just knew that i liked that style of animation because um, when i was a kid one of my favorite shows was called guy king and i don't know if you know guy king i do <laughs> Okay, so one of my favorite shows was Guy King, and there was another show that was my other favorite show, and for the life of me, I can't remember the name of it. So either you or one of the wonderful people listening, if you can identify this show, I will love you forever. There were three primary colored uh, robot things. There was a blue guy, a red guy, and a yellow guy. Each one of them was driven by a different guy. Uh, and depending on which one was on top was which robot they all turned into when they stacked up on top of each other. And they mm. would do, you know, shape of the legs. I'll form the torso, and I'll form the head. And they would, you know, boom, giant robot, amazing. Each one of them had different powers and all this other stuff. It was fantastic. But I don't remember what it was called. So we have a check on anime. So somebody out there must know, and if, if we find out, we'll make sure to tell you. I yeah, actually please. I actually don't. I, my roots more go to, like, Jem, truly outrageous. You know, so yeah. I wasn't watching many robot shows when I was a little girl. No, I was watching anything animated, and uh, that was the only stuff where, where it was animated and stuff was routinely exploding, which if you're a 8, 9, 10, 11, 12-year-old boy, uh, robots that make things blow up are pretty cool. Oh, definitely. And, you know, actually, you don't get to be a robot, but you get to be, you know, an iconic character. I would say iconic by now. You get to be Kakashi and Naruto. So you, you kind of get to make things explode and kind of just pawn people all day. That must be fun. <laughs> it's, uh, I will say this. I, um, for those of you that might be familiar with the uh, greater body of my work, more often than not, I wind up playing the guy who gets killed. You know, like uh, I'm the, the sidekick who gets picked off. I'm the, you know, the underboss that you have to kill to get to the boss. Um, and so it's an amazingly different thing to be able to be the baddest man on the planet. You know, now I know that there are other more skilled and talented ninja in our show, but there isn't another character that I would want to be. Because when the chips are down, it just seems like the greatest thing about Kakashi is no matter what happens, he's got it covered. Very and cool. Said for that. I think that's you really know? neat to, to know. And it, for once, you don't get to practice your death screams. You get to make other people practice mm -hmm. theirs. <laughs> no, and we all have, you know, each of us has a little Clint Eastwood in us. And there's, uh, there's something wonderful about the, uh, the voice that they let me use for him, which is, you know, just basically the lower end of my own natural register. But the way they let me deliver some lines, it's like, you know, if you're, if you're going to kill someone, it's, it's pretty much, or, or for the television uh, version, if you're going to defeat someone, because uh, we do two versions of everything, the DVD version and the TV version, where we can't say kill on TV, but that's another story for another day. Uh, if you're going to do that, you, you want to be able to have like a really cool line right before you do it, and they write me some of the coolest lines in the world. Well, that's actually really cool, and it's a franchise, and not only that, you get to record it pretty much twice, and you get to do all the video games. I think you've there's like 20-something video games now out there. Yeah, it's really funny because we all, um, you know, we, me and Miley and Kate and Yuri, uh, you know, we've all been doing this show for I couldn't even tell you how long. 
Um, and because we all work on, you know, we, we work on all this stuff, uh, we work on other things together where we get to see each other, um, video games sometimes we'll actually get to record together because, as I'm sure people know, when you do anime, it's one person at a time, right? Because you're in the booth, they give you your three magic beefs, you read your lines, you get to see three seconds before what you have to say, and then maybe a couple of seconds after, and then you go on to the next line. Whereas with uh, some of the video games, they'll actually let us go in, like if, you know, if the four of us are on a mission together, they may try and get all four of us in the booth together so we can actually talk to each other. And that actually must be really neat to react off of each other instead of, you know, just listening yeah. to the Japanese and being like, okay, I've got to, I kind of hear their performances, and sometimes you don't even get to hear their performances, correct? Sometimes you do most, I mean, sometimes you don't. Most of the time you do, uh, because for almost everything we do, even the video games, they're, they're done first in Japan, sometimes by only a, a couple of weeks, like, I might get for, you know, one of the upcoming video games, I think I got the audio of the Japanese actor who plays Kakashi maybe two days after he, he recorded it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, but uh, it's certainly helpful to have it because you, you wind up picking up, like, emotional intention of the, of the line and intensity and projection and sort of how, how it was conceived in Japanese. Um... And so you get to uh, remain as faithful as possible to the original uh, performance, but still fitting it in the lip flaps that you have with the line that's been rewritten to fit. Whereas with a video game, we get, you know, yes, you may hear some of the stuff that's recorded, and uh, a lot of times they'll play that for us in the beginning. But then once we get going on something, they'll, they, they will go back and check to make sure we're not getting too far away. But because we don't have time constraints or lip flap constraints, we can ad lib a little bit more in a video game scenario than you can on the show. Now, with mentioning video games, I've noticed sort of a trend, and it could be me, but I've noticed that video game work seems to have exploded in comparison to anime work. Would you say this is true? I would say it's absolutely true. Um, that not only has video game work exploded, it's probably the largest fastest growing segment of the entertainment industry um, but the anime world has contracted significantly because of the availability of online dubs so and, and believe me I'm not uh, I, I understand holding on to your hard-earned money as much as possible um, but because a lot of shows that would would previously even in like say 2002, in 2002, there were companies that were lined up to try and get hold of anime projects. They were bidding against each other um, just to see if they had the next Naruto or, uh, you know, Digimon or whatever it was, whatever, what have you. Oh, look, my, now my neighbor's mowing his lawn, so you can hear it in the background. <laughs> it's okay. I have, I have the leaf blowers come by during my shift, too. <laughs> Well, it's, you know, it's the joy of uh, yard work that I don't have to do. How about that? That's true. That's uh, very true. It's not a bad price to pay for not having to mow my own lawn. <laughs> or my neighbor's lawn, which I would probably mow anyway, I guess. It's, so, yeah. But anyway, the uh, because it's much more available online, content is available online with fan dubs and fan subs and, you know, just the ja original Japanese stuff. There isn't as much call for it in the market. Like, people aren't running out to the video store to buy a box set of whatever the show may be unless they're big fans of the show. Like, where, where maybe somebody would go to their local store every once in a while and, uh, you know, once or twice a, a month and see what the new things were that came in. Now you just go and you check them out online and you see which ones you want. And if you don't want to buy it, you don't buy it. And if you do want to buy it, you do buy it. So it's, anime it's, has contracted, but video games are exploding more and more every day. It's kind of weird, the evolution that anime has gone into, because I remember, you know, as a child, I, 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 don't, I don't have enough money to buy anime as frequently as I wish I could. But, right. you know... I remember as a kid, like, you know, between 9 and 14, running into, you know, Suncoast or one of those stores and being like, this looks good. I'm going to buy it. Mm -hmm. 
and I had no idea what it was. And it's kind of like that's gone now. And it's you could find gems that you didn't think were that that great from you know from maybe if you you watched an episode or two or whatever you heard something bad about it but you could find something you know magical in a store that you wouldn't normally look towards if somebody showed it to you online nowadays right yeah and that's the that's the thing is that it used to be you know and i I have a lot of friends that are this way and i know a lot of fans that are this way that you know you you would take pride in being the person that found the thing that you turned your friends on to you know, like, I bought this DVD, you have to watch it. And then, you know, you would either, people would watch it at your house, or you would lend it to people, and they would enjoy watching it and enjoy, like, oh, this is great, where did you find it? Whereas now, what they'll, you know, they'll just find it somewhere online and send you a link to it. And uh, it's just not the same, it's not the same thing. Right. Uh, and somehow it's not quite as special. But... Ultimately, all of the entertainment business comes down to dollars and cents. And because people don't go to the store to buy that latest, greatest thing that maybe nobody else has seen yet, it's not in the store. Because it's like anything else. If, you, you know, if you've got a push lawnmower in the store, it's probably not going to sell since I can have a ride-on lawnmower instead. Right. It, so. Yeah, it's it's a little bit sad. I mean, 91.8 The Fan has always, you know, wanted to uh, push anti-piracy because it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's weird to see, you know, that people, there, there's this big consensus that, you know, oh, well, it doesn't matter if the anime studios does it or the dubbing studios do it because the original creators aren't getting any money. Right. I, I, it's, it's a weird generation. Well, that- <laughs> That, that is, uh, if you'll pardon the use of the Scrabble word, a specious argument, uh, and I will tell you why. It's sort of a weirdly ironic thing. Uh, when an American company buys the rights to dub a Japanese series, they buy the rights. They have to pay the company that owns the rights in Japan. And more often than not, those companies have contracts with the show creators so that the money, some of the money that's coming from the American company gets to the show creators. So the people who originally made the show are getting paid. I don't know if the actors are, but that's always a whole other thing. Um, and so in a really weirdly ironic way, what's happened is because people love anime so much, they have put it out on the Internet everywhere for free. And no company is going to create a product that you can already get for free. So exactly. in loving it so much that we've put it out there onto the web for everyone to see, we have basically taken away the almighty dollar motive for any company to keep creating it in English. I have to say, you know, it's it's really insightful hearing it from you, you know, because mm-hmm. you, you don't hear so many people in the industry publicly speak about it, and slowly it's becoming a more a more public thing. But uh, just yeah. so we don't run out of time, I'm curious, are there oh, any? We'll okay, All right, I'm curious, are there we'll any current, current or upcoming projects that uh, you want to tell the listeners about that they can purchase at their nearby store or anything? Um, that is a very good question. I have been lucky enough to be working on a bunch of stuff. Um, I know that there are many more Naruto games on the way out. Um, and I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Uh, I think there's another Ninja Storm game. Uh, I'm Off the top of my head, I think that's the only title I can come up with. But the other funny thing about doing these things is that, you know, I just recorded um, an animated movie uh, character for a fairly big animated movie, but I can't talk about it because the movie itself won't be out for two or three years, which is, you know, true of some of the games I'm working on, too. Which we understand. Yeah, so in terms of what's coming out that you could buy, if uh, you can remind me what I might have recorded two years ago, I'd be happy to tell you, go get it. (laughs) Well, is there any place that the listeners can keep track? Do you do the Twitter or the Facebook thing, or do you have a website? I do have uh, I do have a website uh, which is sorely and horribly in need of being updated. It literally, if you go to my website, it will say uh, last updated January first, two thousand six. <laughs> um, for two reasons: one, 
the guy that I had updating my uh, my website, the guy that was sort of in charge of the whole thing, uh, became a real estate agent. So Interesting. He is no longer. Yeah, you would think you'd still have time to do a five minute update on a website for a you know healthy chunk of change, but apparently not. Um, so anyway, so that uh, that stopped, and I myself. I'm very tech savvy, but I'm not very web savvy. So I have a Facebook page, and I also have a Facebook fan page called Dave Wittenberg something something. But that also has not been updated in forever because I have not had the time to update it. So uh, I suppose at this point, it would be fair for me to say that if anyone felt like they wanted to take that job on their shoulders, uh, I, I will accept submissions. Oh, very cool. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners will be interested in that. And yes. hopefully, you know, it, it's as I said, as before, it was really interesting to hear, you know, your take on the the business module and the piracy yeah. thing. I'm, I'm curious, you're, you're not a huge convention goer, are you? I am not a huge convention goer for uh, for like the weirdest of catch 22 reasons. I am lucky enough to work a lot. And so leaving town for a week is really hard for me to do. And most conventions are, you know, most conventions are on the weekend, so I could do like a Friday to Monday thing. Um, but it's, uh, it makes it tougher to be able to get out of town. I do really, really, really enjoy conventions. I love to meet uh, fans. I love to take pictures. I'll sign anything you put in front of me um, to, to a degree. Uh, no, no small children or, or inappropriate body parts, please. <laughs> um, but or or mortgage documents. Um, so I love to go to them, but I just don't often have as much time to do it as I'd like. Understandable. Uh, I'm I'm kind of assu- yeah. I'm kind of wondering now. Are there any stories of you having to sign small children? <laughs> Uh, I was, I will say this, I was in New Zealand, uh, and uh, I had a very, you know, it was a phenomenal experience. They, it was me and uh, and a bunch of, you know, other people that, that were just, you know, celebrities in, in the anime world and the movie world, and, you know, it was great to be able to hang out with all of them, but we each had, you know, a couple of hours a day that we would sign autographs and hang out at a, a big long table, which was great. Um, until uh, this lovely uh, young uh, pair of brothers, like one was probably 12, and the other one was like six, and uh, and they came over, and the 12-year-old was really cute, and the 12-year-old did all the talking, and was like, you yeah, know, my, my brother and I are really big fans of yours. Could you give us an autograph? I'm like, sure, yeah, why not? And they gave me the, 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 the picture of Kipashi, and I signed it, and you know, I gave it back to him, and you know, can we take a picture? He's like, oh, sure, come around, we took a picture. I went back over and I looked at his little brother and I was like, uh, is, "Is there anything I can sign for you?" And he said, "My forehead." And I was like, "I'm sorry." He goes, "Do you sign my forehead?" I said, "I no, I will not sign your forehead." And I swear to you, the kid started to cry. Oh. <laughs> and so now I'm looking at like a, an eight-year-old kid having the worst meltdown of his life because I won't write on his head. So uh, I made him a deal where I took a piece of paper and I folded it into a headband and I signed that. Oh, well, on his forehead. At, at least he, at least you guys had a compromise. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, I, I convinced him it was the best he was going to get. So, you know, <laughs> at some point you go, oh, all right, fine, I'll take what I can get. Well, before so. we let you go, because we, we've had such a fun time and I, I know you got your schedule, we ask mm-hmm. everybody who comes on, whether they're a voice actor or not, if they'd be willing to do a radio bump for us. Sure. And it's live on air for all the goof-ups. <laughs> all right, bring it. Well, we were wondering if you could say, my name is, and you insert your name, I do this, gotcha. you can say a character, your voice actor, whatever you want to say, and you're tuned into 91.8 The Fan. All right, hold on, hold on. Let's, all right, so, so what you want is, uh, my name is... Someone's got a pen Dave, and paper. <laughs> Dave Wittenberg... And I play Kakashi, and you are listening to 91.8 The Fan. Yeah, 91.8 The Fan. Perfect. 91.8 The Fan. 91.8 The Fan? Yes. <laughs> so as opposed to 91 and 8 tenths? You don't want that? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> no. Okay. All right. People so, confuse the numbers all the time. <laughs> all right. Yes. 
then I, no, I'd be happy to. Though I'm, I'm, not, I'm no good with math. Oh, that's okay. Uh, Whenever you're ready. Okay. So, uh, my name is Dave Wittenberg, and I play Kakashi, among other things. And you are listening to 91.8 The Fan. I believe this is Kana's Corner, correct? Yes, it is. Would, that be, would the correct of that be spelled with a K? Would it be Kana's Corner, correct? Yes, it's, uh, okay. it's K-A-N-A. <laughs> K-A-N-A. All right. Which sounds like a really bad radio station in Southern California. You are listening to the K-A-N-A. I try. <laughs> A-N-A is song in, the, in all of the world, something. <laughs> something. Uh, it has been my absolute pleasure. You know what? I'm going to give you a take two. I'm going to give you the oh, Rico wonderful. Suave take two. How do you feel about that? I, I would enjoy it. Thank you so much. Here we go. Hello. My name is Dave Wittenberg, and I play Kakashi, among other things. And you are listening to 91.8 The Fan. Ooh. Like that. A little more Rico Suave. But very sexy. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm all about range. <laughs> and for everybody out there, if you missed any of this interview, don't worry. We'll post it up on the website in the next two days. So keep it tuned to 91.8 The Fan. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And uh, one other side note to my request for submissions. Remember, I, I respect two things above all others. Um, Non-persistence, send me one, I promise I'll read it, and literacy, the ability to put together an actual sentence without text speak or abbreviations. I like a good resume. I like a good sense of humor. Please proceed accordingly. And thank you. Wonderful.